Um, I'm Emma. I'm a computer science PhD student at Stanford, um, where I work a lot on issues of sort of equality and discrimination. In the last year, I've been working a lot on police discrimination and how do we detect that statistically. Um, I work on these things because I like big problems, and I think it is clear to everyone in this room that these are profoundly important problems. Um, I'm super excited to be here. I've never been to this conference before. I was just at NIPS, uh, which is a machine learning conference down in LA, and it's just so totally different from this conference. <laughs> uh, so, so utterly different in perspective. Not, not to knock N NIPS, NIPS is also cool, but, but I think there are a ton of lessons they could take from what's going on here, uh, and, and it's really wonderful to see such a diversity of perspectives. So that uh, I'm profoundly grateful for. However, uh, caveat, I'm about to talk about a controversial topic uh, in a short amount of time to a community that I've never really like talked to before. So this is a risky thing to do. And so I would just ask you that like, if you, know, you disagree with something I say or you think it's wrong, like, come talk to me about it uh, or shoot me an email because I, you know, I love talking to people with whom I disagree. Great. OK, cool. So let's talk about ethical dilemmas in computer science. Uh, algorithms, they increasingly make incredibly important decisions in our society, right? Two examples, criminal justice algorithms are now used to help judges decide who goes to jail. Like, this really matters. Uh, similarly, medical diagnosis, they're used to help doctors decide, like, if your tumor is benign or malignant. So, like, these are things you do not want to get wrong. You know, it is not hyperbolic to say that, like, people may die if you get these things wrong. It is a time of enormous promise, but also of peril. So it is very important that these decisions be fair. What does it mean for an algorithm to be fair? Well, let's consider a case study. Um, this has been in the news a lot recently, so you may have seen this. Um, so the Compass Criminal Risk Prediction Algorithm is an algorithm that helps judges make bail and sentencing decisions. So the way this works is a defendant comes in before the court, and the algorithm assigns the defendant a score on a scale of 1 to 10, trying to predict how likely they are to commit another crime. So 10 means higher risk. Um, and this algorithm, how does it actually do this? Well, it's fit using historical data, um, and it doesn't use a defendant's race, but it uses many other factors, like their numbers of prior arrests, which in their data are correlated with race. Okay. So the news organization ProPublica decides that they're going to look into this algorithm. They're trying to decide whether this algorithm is fair. And they conclude, no, it is not fair. And here is their evidence for this. They say, first of all, black defendants who are rated by this algorithm on average get higher scores, are rated more risky than our white defendants. And further, that this is true even among the population of defendants who do not go on to commit another crime. So if you are a black defendant, you come before this algorithm, you on average will be given a higher score even if you don't commit another crime than a white defendant who will not go on to commit another crime. So this strikes many people you know, intuitively as deeply unfair, right? Because after all, the algorithm is just supposed to be predicting whether you'll commit another crime. So it seems like if you don't, you should get the same average score regardless of your race, right? This is pretty intuitive. So this comes out, it causes a massive hullabaloo, massive media attention. This comes before like literally state Supreme Court cases. This is a really big deal. Uh, and so the company, North Point, of course, issues a rebuttal saying, no, 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 guys, our algorithm is fair. Here's our definition of fairness. Uh, and they say, look, our scores mean the same thing for both races. So regardless of whether you're black or you're white, if you get a six, you have the same probability of reoffending. And this also strikes people as a very important definition of fairness. Because after all, if we didn't have this, if, for example, a black defendant who got a six had the same risk of reoffending as a white defendant who got a seven, then you would have judges treating people differently even though they had equal chances of reoffending. And this also seems quite unfair and quite bad. Oh my gosh, so this is really bad, right? We have two opposing definitions of fairness. But the story gets even worse, actually, because then academics weigh in, and academics never make the story simpler, right? Uh, and, and, and the academics actually manage to prove mathematically and also in real data that, in fact, these definitions of fairness conflict, that in many real-world scenarios, you actually cannot achieve both of them at the same time. So you have to choose between them. So like, this is, this is like very bad. We, we have like two things that both sort of seem reasonable, both seem desirable, but like it's impossible possible in many cases to have both at once. So what are we going to do about this? Um, more broadly, you will find that like, there is often a conflict between trying to predict an outcome as accurately as possible and ensuring that there are no disparities in how you predict that outcome. Right? And, and this is pretty intuitive if you think about you know, sort of optimization problems. Right? If we only care about optimizing one thing, like accuracy, we're going to get a different answer than if we care about like, multiple things, like accuracy while not creating disparities. Right? So this is like, pretty intuitive that this would be true. Of course, 
course, it's very important to think about, is accuracy really what you want to optimize for? So for example, if you design an algorithm which like predicts drug arrests in historical data super, super accurately, like great, what you've managed to do is very accurately predict something which is known to be like the product of racism historically, right, because drug arrests. Okay, fine, so like accuracy is not a be all and end all. Um, Okay, but the basic point here, the basic point here is that there are many reasonable definitions of fairness and that in many real world scenarios they conflict and we often have to choose between them. Okay, so how does this link to diversity? I think what I have concluded from thinking about these issues for a while and sort of from arguing with people is that the answers to these questions are philosophical and they're social and they're value based. They're not necessarily technical, right? So like if we, you know, ask what the answer, what the roots of a quadratic equation are, like we should all agree on that, right? This is not a subjective question. And like if we disagree, like one of us is wrong. Um, but I don't think that is the case with issues of algorithmic fairness. I think these really are questions about which reasonable people can disagree, questions about which you know, what, what, like the values that you favor may depend on aspects of your background and on your life experience. So what does this mean? It means that having diverse perspectives is especially important. Like, because, because if you only take, you know, people from one group, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't like to like demonize like cis white men inherently, I, I, because I, you know, I did, like, like I, I don't think any particular group is evil. What I think is problematic though, is if you only draw from the perspectives on a single group on issues where different groups disagree, like, I'm just a stats nerd, like that's just bad stats, right? Like you're going to get a biased answer to your question. This is not like a social justice issue. This is like a mathematical sampling issue to me. I mean, that, that, but I'm a math nerd. Okay, cool. Um, and and so, so we know, it's, it's deeply plausible that like different demographic groups, race groups, gender groups, you know, sexuality groups, et cetera, would disagree profoundly on questions of values, right? We see this every election, that they disagree profoundly on questions of value. So it's deeply plausible that this could be true for questions of algorithmic fairness as well, that we might see differences. But uh, I don't like to just sort of assert things without having any evidence that they are in fact the case. So this is like plausible, but it might not be true. Uh, so I actually did a survey to prepare for this talk. I, I put out a survey on social media. Um, and, and basically what I did in this survey was I asked people various questions about their background, and then I asked them um, how they felt about various dilemmas in algorithmic fairness. Um, and so what I wanted to see is like, does your background correlate with your beliefs? Now, this is a survey on social media. So before I present the results, I want to present the caveats, which are very important. Uh, first caveat um, is that it's a small sample. So as such, I do not have statistical power to look at differences between racial groups. And I also don't have statistical power to look rigorously at sort of non-binary gender groups. So these are like very important caveats. Um, and I, I, you know, I did this initial survey to kind of motivate future work in this area, which is clearly very important to do. The other important caveat, of course, is that social media groups are like not representative of the general population. Cool. However, with that caveat, I do think the results are interesting, so let's talk about them. Okay, so this is the answer. Uh, so, so here, this, the, these are the answers that people gave uh, to one of these sort of uh, dilemmas, you ask people like, do you think it's more important just to like make the program predict an outcome criminal risk as accurately as possible? Or do you think it's more important to ensure that it produces no racial disparities? So if you're farther to the right, you think that uh, minimizing racial disparities is more important. If you're farther to the left, you tend to think that accuracy is more important. And what you see is that there is in fact differences by gender that emerge, right? That like uh, respondents who identify as male tend to be more likely to say like, we think accuracy is very important. Whereas respondents who identify as female Female, tend to move more to the right on this question. This is not, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there are pronounced uh, disparities that emerge here, and uh, I should say also that all, everything I show you here is statistically significant. Okay, here's another example of this. Um, actually, back back when I was first working in tech, I was a I was a data scientist at an education company. This example is not hypothetical. Um, so, so we were designing an algorithm to recommend courses to students. Uh, and what I found is that if you put gender into the algorithm as a feature, it boosted your accuracy because gender predicted what courses a student would want to take. Uh, but predictively, right, it started pushing people who identified as female away from science classes. So like, this seemed bad to me. Um, 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 but it turns out that like, how bad people actually think this is, uh, is correlated with, uh, with their identified gender. Here you see in response to this question that women are more likely to be like, no, don't use gender as a feature, like increasing the gender gap is very bad, whereas, whereas people who identify as male are more likely to be like, no, 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 accuracy is more important. Okay. Uh, 
However, caveats in social media. So then I was like very curious about this. And so I actually uh, spent some money running this survey again on a platform called Google Consumer Surveys, which is a larger and more representative sample. Um, and you can see this is the same question and sort of the same effects emerge. Again, the, the people who identify male are farther to the right. Um, so we're able to sort of replicate this effect in a more representative sample. Okay. I have no idea how much time I have left. Okay, well, so what, so what have I shown you? Basically, what we've seen um, is that these questions of algorithmic fairness are not purely technical questions. They're not purely mathematical questions, um, although, of course, statistics is very useful in sort of gaining insight into them. They're questions about which reasonable people can disagree. And now we've seen some evidence that, like, how you feel about these questions is correlated with your demographic background. So I think in light of this, uh, there, there are a couple implications. The so one is that I think we should follow up on these results and we should look at, for example, like how people's race correlates with their answers to these questions. I think that's profoundly important to do as well as many other aspects of demographic diversity. Um, but I think in light of this, it's particularly important that we increase the diversity of people having these algorithmic discussions. Because otherwise, basically, the algorithms which are supposed to serve us all and that affect us all, you know, often in very profound life or death ways, um, are going to be reflecting the will only of a tiny subset of the population. And it's not like that subset is evil or malintentioned, but nor is it representative of what we all want. I think it is worrisome that the race and gender groups who are most often harmed by algorithmic disparities are, off, are also the groups who are like least likely to be involved in these discussions. Like this is not a good combination. So I think it's very important in light of the fact that these questions are philosophical as opposed to technical, that we increase the diversity of the people making them. Cool. Oh, and thank you to people who offered thoughtful comments. The paper is online, yes or paper, it's a write-up of these results. <laughs>so you did you redid one of the questions with Google consumer surveys did you redo all the other questions uh, so I, that's that's an excellent question thank you uh, there were two questions that showed statistically significant differences out of four um, and 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 I tried to I replicated the one that you see the other one it basically, I was not confident that I could explain everything about the conflict between accuracy and fairness in like the amount of space that Google gives you, um, nor was I confident that people were going to pay any, like people are like clicking through these questions to try and get to their newspaper, so like I wasn't confident that they would pay attention or that I could explain it. But it's a good question. I did not try to replicate it. Yeah. Hi, thank you. I thought that was a wonderful talk. Um, my question is, what can technical organizations do now to work on this issue? So whether that's hiring more people of non-technical backgrounds who have a skill set in ethics or uh, working on their data set and applying better labels um, because there's not a lot of good data for predicting criminal, criminal activity, right? So uh, curious your thoughts. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Sorry, I forgot to repeat the last question. So the question is like, what can technical organizations do now to try try and work on these issues? Um, I think bringing in people of more diverse backgrounds, not not just in terms of um, demographics even, but also in terms of like, I don't know, hire sociologists, not just like, you know, computer nerds. Um, I, not to be disparaging, I am a computer nerd. Um, I think I should say also that I think, I think a lot of tech companies are working accurately on these issues. I mean, one, you know, at this conference I was just at, you know, there was a woman giving a talk about algorithmic fairness, Kate Crawford, and like the talk was standing room only. Like there were thousands of people there. So it, I, I think, you know, it is, these problems are by no means solved, but it's not that people are not interested in them. I don't, I don't think that's accurate to say. Um, I think, you know, tech companies are interested in collaborating with academics. Um, I think another thing which is really important is, uh, algorithmic transparency is important. So like if you have an algorithm like making decisions about criminal risks, like the details of that algorithm really should be open source so that like people can audit it. You know, like ProPublica had to like, I think file a public records request to get this information. That is not how this should work, I think. I didn't understand the difference between the two versions of fairness uh -huh. uh, early in your talk. Could, could you clarify that please? Yes, that's a good question. Um, so so ProPublica's definition of fairness um, is 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 about like basically, yes. So so ProPublica wants to wants to equalize what's called the false positive rate. So basically, like if you are innocent, what is the probability that the algorithm rates you as high risk? Okay. Um, whereas the company wants to optimize, it wants to equalize something else called calibration. And calibration is basically like if I give you a score, what is the probability that you are guilty? And uh, the the 
the company wants to ensure that that is equal across races. So it's a little, like, it, it's easier if you sort of write it out, but these are not the same thing. Um, and in fact, it's often impossible to achieve both at once. No more time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>